From Corolla One Studios in Glendale, California, this is the Adam Corolla Show. Adam's guest today, from The Con, filmmakers Eric Vaughn and Patrick Lovell. With Gina Grad on news, Paul Bryan on sound effects, Dave Damashek back for good sports, and the deaf frat guy drops by for some JV or all balls. And now, heading back to Texas to lay down what the facts is. Adam Carolla. Yeah, get it on. Got to get it on. Oh, we've got a minute to get on. Our last show before we head into our best of week, but uh, thank you. And and uh, now's the time uh, during the best of to turn someone on to the show at uh, 11 years plus. A great, great product. So share it with a friend. Good day, Gina Grad. Good day to you. Handball, Brian. <laughs> the DFG is here. So um, I... Uh, I'll be transparent. Uh, I just knocked out something sort of colossal with Mark Garagus that we're going to slide in here that has to do with uh, me and the city and the government. And Mark is going bananas the whole time. So I thought you guys might want to enjoy that. And uh, so we'll we'll uh, we'll let, we'll share that with you. This is uh, me and Mark Garagos from a half hour earlier in the same studio from Reasonable Doubt, of course. So enjoy uh this and and it's not a it's not a two minute piece it's a it's a long form piece but uh it really hits a crescendo so enjoy that and then we'll come back with the dfg enjoy all right so back to earth with uh, the deaf, deaf frat guy <laughs> thank you uh <laughs> by the way best best thing ever uh i was uh I walked in here uh, an hour ago. Mark was sitting on the sofa and uh, he looked at me and he goes, uh, where are you guys going? And I said, uh, we're going to San Antonio. And he goes, OK, I think you can take my jet. And I said, uh, OK. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, Chris and Mike, uh, you're on your own. And he's like, no, no, all three of you. And I said, uh, OK, Ooh, when do we leave? When do we have to be at the airport? And he's like, I don't know. When do you want to go? And I go, uh, I don't, I don't know. I guess around eleven thirty with the time difference. He's like, fine, eleven thirty or eleven or twelve. It, it doesn't matter. I'm like, and wow. then what? And he's like, Burbank Airport. I was like, oh, <laughs> fucking a Burbank Airport, San Antonio. We we couldn't even fly into San Antonio. We were going to fly into Austin and drive to San Antonio, Southwest. Jesus. LAS. You know, outhouse, outhouse of the penthouse. I know. <laughs> whether he whether he asked for it or not, which I'm sure he didn't, you are going to have to grant him some sort of sexual favor. I know. I uh Fun. I I'm yeah. going I might even I might even bank a few for the next ask. Sure. So uh that's uh that's, that's good amazing. news. Amazing. Uh Def Rat guy is with us. Uh, DFG. Oh hell yeah. I have my do not disturb hat on. Oh, you had your uh, you had your do not disturb uh, shade on, right? Yeah, <laughs> the, the eye mask. The eye mask. I wear that shit as a mask. Yeah, mm. where uh, how you how's the quarantine treating you? Well, it treated my meat pretty well. I've been beating myself raw. <laughs> you've, been, you've been you've been beating your meat a lot. I think that's it's not it's rarely discussed on Rachel Maddow, but that has to be a subject that. Oh, is yeah. uh, near and dear to most people's uh, hearts. I mean that that's got it's it's got to be up seventy seven percent, right, uh, Maverick? Uh, hell yeah. Um, were we going to do a little uh, JV or, or all balls? And I I, I got to set the table with uh, Maverick. He he was a a seventh year senior at USC when we met you. I think uh, maybe I was fifth year. Fifth oh. year when we met you. I knew it was an odd number. Yeah, yeah. And and then, but two years later when we spoke to you, you were seventh year senior. at uh, And and then you started your own fraternity house. Hell yeah, Delta Fu. Right, because you couldn't, did you rush other <clears throat> other houses and you do, you couldn't get into them? No, dude, I was in a, I was in a house at USD. I can't say the name because they'll sue my ass. But... It was a schism, oh. and we broke away and we started our own thing mm. with a bunch of really cool dudes: Poochie, Moose, Smitty, Chugly, Mike F, Mike L, right, Dude Bagel. Yeah, I always Mike D. Mike, see, right. So what I always said to you is Mike W. Right, you had all these guys named Mike. 
but, and you didn't give them a nickname. You know what I mean? You had Douchebagel and Chugly, and, and, and if you just Poochie. did Poochie, if you'd given the mics a nickname, you know what I mean? You wouldn't have to separate them by, by saying Mike L and Mike W. You, you know what I'm saying? Coke Booger was um, Mike V. Who, oh. who was? Coke Booger? <laughs> yeah. Oh, that was Mike V. So you did give one of the mics a, a nickname then, right? <laughs> well, he earned it. Just him. <laughs> Just Coke Booger. All right. Is he still with us? Yeah, he's, um, he's doing really well. He's um, a day trainer. He's a oh. day trader. Oh, so he's just at home trading. So um, you, yeah. st- you started your own uh, house at Delta Fu. Yeah. Um, you had, uh, I-, I like uh, your coat of arms. What Could you describe that? The coat, I should say, of arms? Yeah, I got the little card right here. Um, but the coat of arms is basically the owl represents wisdom. Owl. The right. um the jackrabbit represents like productivity, you know, like virility. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the owl is puking um, green bile <laughs> to represent the bitterness of the purge <laughs> of the of the schism. <laughs> well, uh. well, <laughs> most people just have animals on their crest. You know, they don't have them vomiting or shitting or doing anything. Yeah, the green. <laughs> The green is filed to represent the bitterness of the purge. I understand. We'll put that up at adamcarolla.com so people can see the Delta food there. Oh, and yeah. then there's a, there's a beer bong and a potato gun. Right. It, it means like fun and, you know, and like All right. or whatever. Right. Beer bong, <laughs> potato gun. <laughs> I get it. It's actually one of the best crests ever, if you think about it. Uh, so we're going to do some uh, JV or all balls here. And now, Hell Andrea yeah. presents the Deaf Frat Guy and JV or All Balls. He calls from the frat house onto the show, the Deaf Frat Guy hearing him pay bro. He's hammered all day long with Poochie Moose and my gift. They chug some brews, shoot potato gums, and then play a peacock game. If something's pushing, he'll make the call. So now it's time for JV Oral Balls. All right. Will you make the call and we'll and we'll see if we're right. JV are all balls. Here we go. Now JV's obviously bad and all balls is great. Go ahead. Uh, outside antagonizers. Outside antagonizers. People who come who join a rally and, and agitate, but not mm. they're not it's not their city. It's outside or their cause. Or their cause, yeah. Or even their cause, right, right. Could be the cause. They, they, Yeah, they could physically come from somewhere else or they could just be going out saying they're for Black Lives Matter and, and burning down liquor stores. Sure. Umbrella uh, man, breaking windows. Yeah, I uh, I say that's got to be JV. I mean, that's, a, that's an easy one, right? I go JV, Brian. Yeah, I don't see an upside to this. Uh, they're, they're, they're making the situation worse for everyone. JV. Yeah, it's definitely JV because then not only is the city in shambles, but the wrong people may be getting blamed for it. Right. JV across the board, Mav. Oh, yeah, it's JV. I remember when I told the guy that the, tr- that the stigma moves, I'm going to do a dance on our faces if we don't clean up those pumpkins. Right. And guess who did the, guess who did the pumpkin? Oh, wasn't this? Who was it? Another frat house? Blake Chambers. Blake uh, Chambers. Uh, I hate that guy. So Blake yeah, Chambers. Big new. Blake Chambers is the guy who throws the Sigma new pumpkins and then blames it on you guys. Yeah, they, they, they did it basically did a dance on our faces until we got, um, you know, a shitload of potatoes. Yeah. Right. So, so Blake Chambers in this example would be an outside agitator. He started a war between the houses that did not need to happen. Understood. 
still fresh after all these years. Yeah. <laughs> still it's just like reason. yesterday. They, they, you know, they, they, they did it with pumpkins, right? Uh, yeah. Well, last time I checked, the Yukon Gold is a little harder than a pumpkin. Oh, oh yeah. Wow, that's tough talk. Yukon, is that is that the ballistic round you use in your potato gun, Yukon Gold? Yeah, because it's it, that oval shape gives it good um, aerodynamic. Good, mm. mu- good muzzle velocity. All right. Let's go to the next one. A round potato. Oh, okay. I got to right. keep going. Yeah, new potatoes are no good. The round ones are no good. Yeah. Russet, too starchy, too big. I th- dude, I don't know if my memory is going on me, but did we do um, hickeys last time? No. No. Okay. I don't think so. Hickeys. Uh, hickeys. That's a tough one. That's yeah, supposed to be your age. Yeah, yeah, it used to be kind of proof positive that uh, you were making out, and making out used to be such a thing. I don't even know. God, the, the notion of just what base did you get to sounds like, to me, what base did you get to sexually is, that is to sex what um, a pickpocket is to crime these days, right? Like now it's like, oh, those guys just beat the shit out of that old woman for no reason. And and I, it makes me look back and, and wax poetic about pickpockets or folks that way. And I, I feel the same way about the bases. The hickey, I I don't know, a hickey circa 1979, cool in today's day and age, especially with all the Me Too stuff going on. I'm going to say JV. Mm. Yeah, JV. There's no upside at our age. I'm going all balls. And here's why, Adam, you you kind of alluded to it with all the crazy shit that's going on in the world and all the horror. If if somebody walked into the workplace with a hickey, it would be the talk of the town. We'd be laughing. We'd be joking about it. We would need the story It would take our minds off of all this darkness for, you know, 10, 15 minutes talking about the person with the hickey. It's like showing up with a puppy or, or a bouquet of flowers. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. All right. So uh, we have two. Uh... JV and won all balls, DFG. I'm going to... Sorry, Tina. I'm going JV. Oh, shocking. I, well, look, I want the, I want the lady to treat me with respect, not make me look like I just went 15 rounds with a lamprey eel. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought of Lamprey, like yeah. yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, I'm with you. All right. Well, it's one and one with Gina and two and oh with me and bald. Here okay. we go. All right. Okay. Grappling hooks. Grappling hooks. Grappling hooks were a big deal when I was a young kid. Every movie started off with guys in a rope and a grappling hook, and they'd swing it around and throw it over a prison wall or throw it onto the roof of a building, and it would catch the parapet or the mansard or whatever was on the roof of the building, and then they'd scale up the rope. Uh, they always did it with always such... Always successful on the first try. Yeah, always successful on the first try. By the way, uh, good luck to you if you're not successful with the grappling hook because <laughs> that is a that is a 50 angry lawn darts coming down on your head. Like if you do the swing around and then throw it up and it comes up six inches short on the parapet of the... And it doesn't... It's coming straight down on top of you. And it's nothing, it's nothing but giant, giant hooks. I think the proper one has like three, three big, big hooks. But also people used to climb rope with ease. Uh, Mm. I don't think criminals, I've seen a lot of criminals. These are big dudes now. I mean, the rope was a half inch thick, right? And they'd go, they'd swing it around and they'd throw it on the roof of a three story, three story building. And then they just grab the half inch rope and start walking up the side of the building. Like just just 30 foot, just here we go. I don't. I don't know that uh, that uh, today's heavy set criminal could pull that one off, um, but I like the grappling hook. It meant a lot to me. Every uh, every action figure had a grappling hook. Came with it, you know, GI Joes and Action Jackson and all that kind of stuff. So uh, it's a it's a happy memory. It's a it's a positive part of my childhood, and I'm, for that, I'm going to say uh, all balls. No. Yeah, yes, we're, we're on the same. Yes, we're on the same page here because uh, I'm sure in reality the grappling hook does not fulfill the promise set by TV and movies. Mm-hmm. That said, my image of it is super positive. Batman, you know, firing it up. It's right. all. It's, it's all. It's so cool. It's GI Joe. Yeah, all balls. 
All balls. Yeah, I, I'm going to also have to say all balls because like Adam alludes to a lot, you know, criminals today are lazy. They're doing this from a basement. God knows where they're out of shape. They can't even climb up the stairs. This this harkens back to a, a better time, more sportsman like way to do crime. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. All balls. Hell yeah. All ball. All right. Yeah. The grappling hook. The, you know, hmm. get real. Yeah, yeah. The, the best. The gra- the then. The, the best um, version of the grappling hook was the powered one where they'd fire it from the gun and just poof, you know, go up. And it, again, yeah. it always it always grabbed. It, it grabbed every time yeah. it, it would do it would do it. Every, and no one there was never any discussion on the ground. You know, it's like they'd shoot it up. It grabbed something like, here we go, Stu. And it'd be like oh. no one ever went, oh, well, maybe it's hooked on a piece of PVC pipe for a vent for like a toilet or something. I've been on a roof a few times. Yeah. Like, there's a lot of shit up there. You know, you know they had that they had that plastic owl up there who was trying to uh, scare the seagulls away. Maybe it's hooked on his ass. Like, maybe we should yank on it a couple times. Or maybe you should go first. They never have never, that discussion. Never any well, thought to, hey, there could be 10 guys patrolling that roof and right. they see a grappling hook come up and they're cocking their guns. That's right. You know what you have to do to make those owls work? You have to have them puke green bile yeah like like every 30 uh. seconds to scare off the burns you know as i think about it the worst guards the worst police force ever are the guys who guard the outside of the mansion at night in any movie like the guard the guys like walking by they're passing mm-hmm. each other those guys always get taken out immediately and cleanly they don't make a sound they don't sound yeah. the alarm they never return a shot they don't put up a struggle they just they just take them out they're taken out they're they're virtually worthless there's, yeah, there's props yeah there's like 14 guys patrolling the outside of the mansion and if you go at night one guy can, chuck norris with no weapons can take out all 14 guys who are heavily armed and ostensibly professional guards but it's not like oh what do you do well i i, I do i do some uh, balloon animals at birthday parties but on weekends i'm a guard <laughs> I guard the drug lord. Yeah, this guy's always taken out immediately. Like, I wouldn't even, if I were the drug lord and I was inside the house and somebody said, we have security, I'd be like, I don't even count those guys. Every single movie I've ever seen, those guys are taken out in 10 minutes. They're the equivalent, remember Adam, tackling dummies, uh, defensive drills in football? Yes. They might as well just not be there. Sure, it's like a figure, but you're not really doing much. All right. What do we got? One more uh, DFG? Yeah, we can do one more. Let's do what, one more. Um, but there are two good ones. But mm-hmm. the, um, okay, what about adults who wear overalls? This is from my boy Ben Mitchell. Mm, adults that wear overalls. It can be hot on the right chick. Yeah, it, it can yeah, be a shit yeah. show on the wrong dude. Mm-hmm. I, Think of you know Dukes of Hazard. I but yeah, side boob. Side uh-huh. boob is hot. I feel like overalls are something you need to earn. Like there's nothing worse than hipster Hollywood dude who's wearing the big lineman boots, you know, with the big heel on them and like the steel shank and the steel toe and they lace all up. And then he's got his tight jeans and they're like rolled up at the bottom. Mm -hmm. I hate that dude. That dude has no business wearing a boot. He's never using it. He's basically like the same douche with the Jeep and the big lift kit and the big knobby tires on it. Who's never been camping and never been off road. That guy's always the guy who's five, nine and a half and he's a boot guy, but he's really just, I need another two inches guy. So that douche walks around and I feel like that, that is guy. the greatest story I have ever heard. <laughs> Danny was a cowboy booter, but yes, I. At least he rode a motorcycle. Yes. I worked construction and I feel like I earned my boots and I feel like if you're going to wear coveralls, you got to earn your coveralls. You got to, you got to operate a train, you got to work on a farm or something. And for that reason, I go JV. Yeah. We should go different on this one because we're tied. So I agree with everything you said. However, the benefit outweighs the, uh, the, the negative in the sense uh, that we alluded to earlier, the hot chick and the, uh, and the overalls that that's worth uh, 20 of those douchebags walking mm-hmm. around with the boots and the overalls. I'll take it on the rare chance that I get to see a girl wearing those. All balls. 
I always thought overalls on adults were ridiculous. However, when I stepped into the preschool classroom the first day taking a child to preschool and saw all the hot Encino moms in their hot little overalls, I didn't realize until last September, apparently overalls on adults are all balls. Oh, and uh, yeah, let's not forget Dexie's Midnight Runners. (laughs) <laughs> That's right. There was oh, that Keep, was a heavily heavily laden with overalls. All right, clean up your screen, <laughs> Max Zapata, please. All right, here we go, DFG. <laughs> Two all balls and one JV. <laughs> all right, I'm gonna go. This is for my love of uh, wrestling and my and one of my favorite dudes, Hillbilly Jim. Hillbilly Jim. <laughs> Hillbilly Jim. Right. I gotta go all balls. Nice. Oh, that guy no. kicked Hillbilly. ass in overalls. <laughs> I didn't even think about the lady angle. I was just thinking about Hillbilly Jim. Well, <laughs> Brian, that it may be the gayest thought ever, but it could be the straightest thought ever simultaneously. You know what? Volvo, 80s, 90s wrestling was steeped in uh, homoeroticism. Hillbilly Jim wasn't that homoerotic. He was just a fucking hillbilly or overalls, the big old beard and shaggy hair. And he just he was a ass. good dude, just a solid dude. Well, he'll be missed. Deaf rat guy, everyone. And by the way, his friend Josh Gardner has a new single out called Mr. Macho Man. And you can listen to that on uh, YouTube and you can shoot him a tweet. Give him some JV or all balls at uh, Deaf Frat Guy. Uh, do we have an outro or? Oh, thank you. That was JV or all balls with the Deaf Frat Guy. Brought to you by Mangria. All right, we're going to take a uh, quick break. Eric Vaughn and Patrick Lovell. 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 It's L-O-V-E-L-L. Was there an astronaut with that name? Anyway, they got a five- Jim Lovell. Yeah, got a five-part uh, docu-series, which is really good, called uh, The Con, and it's about uh, the crisis and uh, the financial crisis of 2008 and all the big, scary people that made all the money while all the little guys got screwed. Uh, spoiler alert. So we'll get all into that. And by the way, how it may, a lot of similarities to what's going on right now, and we'll do that with those two experts right after this. And now... Alcoa presents Definitely Not a Jew on the Adam Carolla Show. Dateline, Lower Nazareth Township, Pennsylvania. A 51-year-old man was charged with making terrorist threats, assault, disorderly conduct, and harassment after wielding a machete and threatening his neighbors because they were lighting fireworks. Definitely not a Jew. Well, we got a couple of filmmakers here. Eric Vaughn, Patrick Lovell has joined us virtually. The Con is the name of the five-part docu-series, which will uh, be in virtual cinemas August 7th and available for digital rental on August uh, 21st, I should say. Thanks for joining us, guys. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having us. Um, I, uh, who's, was this, uh, Patrick, was this your idea initially? I just got wiped out in the 2008 great financial crisis and I was trying to figure out what happened. And nine years later we did. <laughs> well, what do you, what do you mean? What do you mean by wiped out? I mean, without getting into the nitty gritty, what did it before? Oh, I, I, I went through foreclosure like millions of other people. I, wow. I've been a producer for a long time and I was in actually at that time I was about to be 40 years old and I was, uh, you know, still am thankfully. And, and, and actually it's a, it's a miracle that I still am considering what we went through, but married a uh, young son at the time. And like millions of other people, man, it was like, I went from living the American dream to the American nightmare overnight and it didn't add up. And now it does. I, uh, well, we'll get to that and how it adds up. Yeah. I, I had young twins at the time and I lost my job and I remember thinking my entire radio career that I was going to get shit canned because of something I said, but then I would just move to another job. So I would say something horrible on the air, possibly about Asians, and then have to leave. 
and then I, but I was I would get picked up by another radio station like so I would be a player that would get cut from one team and picked up by another team because I was a good player but I didn't know the whole league was going to collapse I didn't I didn't count on that and I had the same thing there was no more I'd worked in radio for 15 years there were zero jobs in radio and and I had I guess two-year-old twins or one-year-old twins at the time. So uh, two. no, eh, two. one or one or two. Yeah. Anyway, Eric. Uh, it was February of '09. February of '09. Shit. Let's see, they were born in uh, seven. Oh, six. Oh, well, now yeah, we're whatever the... the fuck. Who knows? <laughs> anyway, who cares about those shits? Uh, sorry. <laughs> and uh, Eric, sorry. What what brought you in? Oh well, uh, kind of a funny thing. Um, I guess you could almost say that Patrick and I were some of the first job losses from the uh, great financial crisis. We were actually producers on a reality television show uh, that was about giving away homes um, to uh, young or whatever, deserving people, that kind of thing. It's called Home Team. It's uh, no longer around, but uh, obviously. And uh, what we didn't realize at the time was that it was uh, it was underwritten by a subprime lender. Mm. Ah, right. <laughs> Oh. And so uh, when we had just finished like our most successful season ever, we had the best numbers ever. In fact, Patrick down there, uh, he had a, the, the episode, one of the episodes that he produced, like killed it in New York. And uh, so we were flying high. We we're about ready to renegotiate our contracts and this and that and the next thing. And then next thing you know, it's like you find out, oh, uh, we're letting everybody go. We're stopping production and uh, have a nice day. So oh, Brian, and, uh, that was March of what 2007 something yeah like right when the whole thing started to <laughs> to deconstruct yeah brian, brian found out he was out of a job and then found out he had an inoperable brain tumor 10 minutes after he found out he was out of a job so that was so a, it was about a month later it was about a month and a half later we, we don't want to be a one-upper <laughs> yeah. yeah so you guys think you had an well, hard oh my there. reality show went away oh yeah well let me show you this star right here <laughs> so can i ask a I'm, wait I'm sure gina we'll, we have to ask yeah. where were you what ha- where were you when the when the economy all collapsed? All three of us were on the same station. We all lost our jobs on the oh, same right. day. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Oh, oh, I was I was effed in the A. I I had no. You have work. pictures. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure I have a mural um, mm-hmm. somewhere. Yeah. No, I I was living essentially in Skid Row, uh, bordering Echo Park in downtown. I was kicking chickens away from my door. I had to ask gangbangers to please get their slurpees off my car. <laughs> I was escorted home at night by police officers who would walk behind me so they wouldn't people wouldn't know I was with them. I was I was flat out broke, and I was on. I had a little bit of unemployment. I think it was like two hundred bucks a week and. Just made it work until my next radio gig. What? Uh, so what happened? <laughs> what? 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 Give us the gestalt, uh, the Reader's Digest version of what happened with the financial crisis of uh, 08, We'll just call it. All right. Well, let's see. Let me try to give us this uh, the quickest run possible. So you had a bunch of um, non-bank lenders, you know, places like Countrywide or AmeriQuest or what have you who had uh, just transmuted themselves from, uh, from uh, a lot of the uh, fraudulent SNLs from the SNL crisis that kind of preceded things back in the uh, late 80s, early 90s. So they basically learned their technology during the SNL crisis. One of them managed to make it out without being prosecuted. That was uh, AmeriQuest. And AmeriQuest uh, started to uh, take this uh, this uh, fraud scheme that they were using in the SNL crisis and apply it to mortgages. And so in so doing, they had to drop their charter because they were at SNL, which means that they were federally regulated. And so in order to avoid regulation, they dropped their insurance, which means that the federal government was no longer going to insure anybody's deposits within the SNL. And so that put them effectively in what's quote unquote called the shadow sector. Um, where there was basically no regulation, no law enforcement, that sort of thing. And they managed to create this, uh, recreate that same fraud scheme with mortgages and start offering mortgages to people um, quite often through fraudulent means. And the way that they got their money, since they were no longer insured, is that Wall Street banks would create what are called warehouse lines to funnel money into these um, mortgage companies to go and sell all these bad mortgages 
so that they can make money on, on, on the other side. And the really interesting thing about that is how they make money. Because when you're selling bad mortgages, ostensibly uh, speaking, those mortgages are going to like not get paid, right? Which means right. that the money's going to come through. However, that's where accounting comes in. Basically, once you sell the mortgage and you like go through the whole process of getting it, you know, uh, tied down and wrapped up and underwritten, blah blah blah. And there's a whole process for that, by the way. Um, you're able to call those profits. Right. And so, any bank manager, bank CEO who ran any of these places were able to extract bonuses based on these profits that have not been realized yet. And that's basically how they made money. They basically robbed their own banks. Do you guys? And that happened. Sorry, but here's here's a yeah. kind of overall gestalty sort of societal psychological question. I've often thought about the dangers of making money invisible and money's invisible to like my kids. My daughter has a, a phone and it was a funny thing. I, I was I was petting my dog, Phil, today, 110 pound black lab. And I was lamenting that Phil doesn't really like me anymore. He hangs out with my son. He doesn't he doesn't sleep with me anymore. He's not cool with me. And my uh, son said, that's because I give him all the treats. I'm in charge of giving him the treats. That's why he loves me. And I looked at Phil and I said, I wish you could understand who pays for the treats. <laughs> because then you would love me right now. You got no time for me. You got all time for the guy who hands out the treats, but not the person who pays for the treats. And I said, oh, by the way, that's universal. I wish my daughter understood who was paying for the treats. And we transitioned from a real tangible dollar and change or, you know, uh, ingots or pieces of eight or whatever pelts. We went right through to this digital world where you just hear, Oh, $10 billion got transferred into blah, blah. And we go, yeah, okay. Or the debt 200 kajillion billion dollars. Like uh, that's going to cost every American $13,000. Oh, like we're just like, it's all numbers just flying all around. And we're so, we're not, maybe my kids will be acclimated to it. We're, we weren't ready for this. I, I started off with a, a sparklets bottle filled with change. You know what I mean? Like as a kid and now everything's just electronic transfer and you, know, you sign something on your phone and press send. Like, are these guys able to get away with murder because society, you know, Congress, they barely know how to work the internet. You know, I mean, they don't, they don't, you hear these guys interviewing, you know, Mark Zuckerberg and they're like, uh, oh. listen, Sonny, uh, I, uh, 22 skidoo. Now what's this say? I got a, I got a flip phone. How does this work again? Like we're so far behind. They know we're behind the smart guys with the digital shit and the money. No, we don't know what the fuck's going on. Is that, is that a fair statement? I think you nailed it. Uh, and, and with you into it, the the what everybody knows. Everybody knows the system's rigged. Everybody knows that uh, somebody's corrupt. They just don't know who did what, when, and how. And what our story is really, it's a murder story. It, it's the story. It's the murder of the American dream. But it's got tangible faces every step of the way. When you guys started talking about your own experiences in 2008, yeah, I got wiped out. I was on the edge of my fingers, man. You know, I didn't know which way was up and nothing made sense, especially from media or the government, right? And right. to your point, Adam, it was like, okay, look, I'm a guy that grew up same time period, listening to you quite frankly in LA a lot. And, um, you know, I, I, I would like to think I wasn't naive. I, you know, I mean, come on, growing up in the eighties, we know of like Pablo Escobar and hmm. Michael Milken and Wall Street, but I think we all believed in the end the long arm of the law would catch up to criminality. At least that's what we saw in Hollywood films, right? Well, as it turns out, no, that's not the case, man. The bad guys took over and they ran away with it because nobody understands who did what, when, and how, and what they got away with until now. Uh, Brian had a question, then Gina, I, I think. I had a follow-up for Eric and what he was just talking about. When you talk about executives taking bonuses based on unrealized profits, future profits, I'm guessing, is that is that kind of Ponzi scheme-ish or was, was ostensibly were they going to realize those profits had everything gone well and the bottom not fell out? Like what would there have been, would that have been like a legit thing or what, was it always doomed? 
No, no, no. It, you're exactly right. I mean, as far as like Ponzi scheme, yeah, it's it's it, it very much smells like a like a Ponzi scheme, and and that's exactly how they treated it. I mean, when you know that you are putting people into loans, and quite often fraudulently putting them into loans, and like everybody talks about, like uh, you know, like all these like homeowners were trying to get too much house and so on and so forth. Uh, they don't know what the, what need what's required on the paperwork. That was all coming from the brokers. That was all coming from the mortgage lenders. And so when they are, when you know that you're putting out bad loans that you know are never going to be paid, then of course it's a Ponzi scheme. Of course, you're 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 purposefully extracting those those profits, knowing that the bank is never going to get it. But you do have this knowledge because uh, uh, back in the at some point, uh, Mr. Greenspan in an announcement basically said, for all intents and purposes, if the banks ever failed, we got your back. You're all good. <laughs> mm. So that, to a large extent, that provided cover. So it's like, sure. oh, yeah, go and steal from your own bank all you want because the Fed will help pay back. We'll, we'll pay it back anyway. Has anyone been prosecuted? Is there anybody who's oh. going to take oh, a fall for this? There huge prosecutions. There's Fabulous Fab, who is like a mid-level <laughs> trader. <laughs> That's um, yeah, exactly. Right. And uh, and uh, I think it was a small family-owned bank in Chinatown. Yeah. In so so all the major players. This right. is this is kind of my question, and I think I speak for most of America when I say that you know, especially in our age group, um, our first look into this and really breaking it down was the movie Big Short. So I'm curious, first of all, how close do you think they got it? Really trying to distill this for the for the rest of us, and also you just kind of proved what I was thinking, which was it, when when Tony Soprano sits down and you want to talk to him, he immediately gets up and leaves the table and brings in his underboss. So were the were the CEOs so completely insulated that you're never going to get the guy at the top? <laughs> yeah. This country is more and more run off of a simple phrase and that phrase being plausible deniability. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that, that that's the beauty of uh, what uh, the uh, Office of Thrift Supervision, this tiny little regulating, you know, regulatory agency in the government did during the SNL crisis is that they identified what was going on as accounting control fraud, right? And the beauty about accounting control fraud, if you're like one of these fraudsters, is that who likes accounting? It's like the most boring thing ever. Nobody has the patience to go and sit through stacks of papers in order to find out what the heck's going on. And so that's like one of the major beauties of it. And you know, and you have people who don't even know how to look at these who are kind of pushing the buttons at, at the government level. Brian? You guys are documentary filmmakers, and this is obviously an area of expertise at this point. You spent, um, God, I don't even know how many hours putting this together. Have you guys, and you mentioned the prosecution has been a lot of mid-level, uh, not the big, you know, the big um, fish. Have you guys heard of a documentary or even seen uh, Abacus, Too Small to Jail? Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a great documentary. It's about, Adam, it's about the only financial institution that was prosecuted uh, at the time in 2017 uh, for the, during the crisis was this very small family run Asian uh, yeah, uh, lending corp, it. basically, right? That basically mm -hmm. uh, only dealt with like the Asian community. They're a very important part of their community because all the native speakers couldn't go to the big banks. And the funny thing is, is that they actually got busted because they self-reported. One of the brokers was doing something, they did the right thing and self-reported. And so then all of a sudden the feds come down. Ugh. No Here's good deed. To answer the question that Gene asked about the Big Short, yeah. look, I, I love the Big Short, but the, the, it's it's categorized as a comedy. I don't know what's funny about tens of millions of people losing everything and all the calamity that you see, particularly in Southern California with homelessness. A lot of it attributed to this, by the way. Um, but you know, in terms of prosecutions, that's the whole point of what we found through a tragedy. Um, Eric had the presence of mind of actually he relocated his his production company we've been partners for a long time but he was located in southern california and he went back to ohio and we had gotten the top part of the story let's call it the c-suite view in whistleblowers and things that were happening in maneuvering and quite frankly a financialized way like the big short and eric kept saying now guys this this is a crime this this is a uh, this is a street crime let's figure out what that looks like and so he started exploring that and he found a woman who became through a tragedy, our protagonist and our muse. And she was an African-American woman, 91 years old, on the day that uh, they came to evict her from a house that she lived in over five decades, four decades, that she and her husband had worked incredibly hard to own because they had 
migrated from the agrarian South to the industrial Midwest as part of that World War II generation. They owned their house, they owned it outright. And in the end, she's standing after her husband passes away uh, with the sheriff coming to evict her. She ends up shooting herself in the chest five times and uh, trying to um, avoid homelessness, I guess is one way we could think about it. Um, and as we started to investigate this story and what it led to, it miraculously opened up this door to us that there was a white collar task force in Ohio, Summit County, Ohio, all of this within about two mile radius of where uh, Eric put his new production company. And um, as it turns out, these guys did a multi-year investigation, put all the pieces together correctly and came up with a RICO conviction of the same crime that was happening throughout the country. And to your point, Gina, the exact same crime that the CEOs of Wall Street were perpetrating. But in this case, they got RICO and the Department of Justice decided to let them get away with a big, 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 big bailout. The, um, you know, it's kind of an interesting, I had a exchange with attorney Mark Garagos uh, that we played a little earlier in the show, but I was explaining about some trials and tribulations I was going through with the city and going through with this. And Mark always says, why don't you just reach out to me? I would have, I would have been able to take care of it. I'll, I'll handle it. And I always say to him, thank you. But what about all the people that don't know you? You know what I mean? Like uh, no one has this, this people don't realize they don't have access to this information. They don't have someone, they don't have the connections. They don't have the relationships, you know, part of having some success is knowing a Mark Garagos or and being able to call him and go, Hey Mark, here's what's going on. Give me, and, and that guy will save your life or calling Dr. Drew and going, here's what's going on. What do you got? But most people, and especially financially, people just don't have those relationships and need, they don't have anyone in their immediate family who has them either. And it's just sign here. And you've just signed away a 22% loan on a credit card that you could never possibly pay off. And th there's so much of that predatory behavior. And it's also people that know, you know, when you're, when you want to get your shoe shined at the airport, you go, here's 10 bucks. And then you watch the guy shine your shoes and he either does a good job or a shitty job, or maybe you don't give him the 10 bucks until after he does a kick-ass job. And then you give him the 10 bucks and we can all do that. This financial shit is an enigma wrapped in a mystery to almost everybody I know. Uh, nobody has any proper financial education. Most people don't know the, the difference between gross and net. And it should be taught. It should be taught starting in the fifth grade. It is avoided. We talk about wars that took place, you know, 300 years ago. We never get into this subject. I don't know if that's part of a conspiracy to have all these needy, financially illiterate people just to walk onto college campuses or go on, go into a Home Depot and sign up for a credit card they can't afford or whatever it is. But we are cranking out masses of people that have no literacy financially with finances at all. And at a certain point, we're going to have to start focusing at, at, on the school boards, like at a certain point, you guys got to start teaching some of this stuff. We're going to have to talk about it. I took ceramics classes. I took home ec classes. I took a, a thousand, you know, history classes. I never took anything that had to do with finances or I was completely literate and preyed upon the second I, I left North Hollywood High. Would you guys like to address that? All right. Well, I think uh, there was a, a Nobel Prize winning uh Economist, uh, it's the, it was a George Akerlof and uh, was it Romer? Yeah, Patrick? yeah, exactly. Uh, who uh, who had described uh, this concept, and it's really kind of funny because um, you know they have like these genius brains to who describe something where when you really think about it, it's just kind of common sense. Um, but what they described was called the asymmetric information and the dangers of asymmetric information within a market economy. And basically what that is, is that if you know more about the product that you're selling than the person that you're selling it to, and you don't convey that information, you're in a position basically to defraud that person. And so, I mean, whether, I mean, I, I don't want to you know, subscribe some sort of, you know, crazy, you know, 
plot against uh, uh, America in, in this regard, but there's certainly an advantage by having a naive, uh, you know, public. Right. In that you can take advantage of them. Mm -hmm. It's easy to take advantage of people who are who, who do not have that kind of knowledge. When when Gina and I were were uh, respective uh, freshmen in college, all you saw were just booths and stands. Like, oh, sign up for this credit card, sign up for this credit card. And I, there's no doubt, there's there's literally no doubt in my mind that that the financial institutions benefit from ignorance. Yeah. Now, if you want to educate yourself, that's up to you. But of course, they benefit from your, from your ignorance. You're 18 years old, and you're running up a credit card bill like, oh, free money. To Brian's point, and I can't believe they were ever allowed on campuses, especially during freshman orientation week, which is when they really set up in the quad. My mom is a banker and I was 18 and came home and told her I signed up for a credit card. And mom, I got approved for like a platinum card. And she freaked out and she goes, well, what did they give you? And I go, a slinky, a rainbow slinky. It's huge. It's like three times the size of a ring. And she lost it. And she, but she wasn't yelling at me. You don't, you don't yell at the five-year-old that you give the car keys to, you know, it, it, she was going, so this is what they're doing on these campuses. Well, good luck to both of you. You know, she was fuming and she, she was right to be fuming. The APR was like 39%. I had no idea what was going on. So to Brian's point, they set up on college campus, they give out tchotchkes and you go, oh yeah, I got, I guess I got five minutes before the next orientation starts. Well, to, to that point, I mean, and also to, to bridge that to what Eric was talking about, this guy Akerlov, his, 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 you know, uh, incredible worldwide recognition came from the title Fishing for Fools. Mm -hmm. Exactly what you're talking about. And, and as we pulled this thread and we went down this pathway, I mean, I, I basically I got a, a brand new education in reality. I had no idea this was the thing that was happening behind the scenes, right? As our country evolved uh, from the eighties onward. And what we learned was this was all part of the administrations in succession from Reagan, all the way through Clinton, particularly that led to what we call the three Ds, deregulation, desupervision and decriminalization. And so what that did was that just enabled this black box of stuff that Adam, you were talking about. In fact, all of us are talking about this of deception, really. And what it is, is if you don't understand, you are being set up, right? So for example, after the 2008 great financial crisis, most of media, particularly on the conservative side, were blaming uh, people for using their houses as ATMs and so forth. Well, there was a method to that madness. And quite frankly, the industry itself had, in their own words, a business model. And it was to predate on the weak, the meek, and the ignorant. That was in their words, right? right. And so they went after, literally, African-American widows that had equity in their home. Oh, yeah. That was a business model. So they literally targeted, we've got so much more information about that, but that literally is like the domino in, in our head. So as we went through this path over the course of years, it was like we opened up one Pandora's box to the other. And in the end, what we found out, and, and you really, Adam, you nailed it. You, you should, all of us should be educated to this because we're all affected no matter who we are. You know, that's why we did this, because we've got five and a half hours that will show you exactly what happened and who did what, when and how. So you go from common knowledge. In fact, I'll, I'll ask you, Eric, to comment about that. Well, can I say this? I think there's a stigma around money and we all grow up with it. And it's kind of the problem as I experienced uh, hosting Loveline for all those years. People feel weird about talking about sex and they feel equally as weird talking about money. And it's, you know, you go, don't ask, don't ask, you know, and you start asking, what do you make or how much or whatever? It's like, D -d 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 don't be rude. You know what I mean? And so money is a little tabooey. And it is a little energy around it. And so as a society, kind of like sex, we've kind of went like, eh, don't, don't, don't ask too many questions. It's rude to ask too many questions. And so we all kind of grow up in that religion in, in a way. If you just applied it to being Mormon and sex or something like that, it's a, kind of the same thing. Like it's, it's, it's a touchy subject. Don't ask questions. And it, much like sex, some, you know, it's not really even properly taught in, in school. And so then you have this public who thinks you can, uh, you know, pull out and that's birth control and who thinks you can sign up for a platinum credit card when you're 19. Sorry, Eric, go uh, ahead. 
Oh, no, no, no. Um, actually, you bring up a really good point, and, and that very much describes the situation that Addie Polk, you know, one of the main subjects of our entire series, we follow her story from episode one all the way through to episode uh, five, um, is that all of her friends and, and, and the people within her church described her as somebody who was uh, just kept to herself about personal things, and the intuition there was that it was money. She never talked about money. And that, you know, she was left uh, two pensions. Um, her, her husband, Robert, um, had uh, passed away, but he had worked his entire life at two rubber factories. And so she was drawing from that. And, uh, but, but just to get to the point that she never talked about those things. And that was one of the reasons why she was so isolated when the sheriffs were coming to evict her. And she had nowhere to go, nobody to talk to because of that taboo. She would not talk about it with anybody. And so she was basically left it alone and left her own devices. Eric, comment about common knowledge versus specific knowledge. Uh, yeah, um, absolutely. So when we were designing um, how we wanted to build um, this documentary, uh, one of the things that I did is I looked towards the, the, uh, the story of uh, Spotlight, you know, the Boston um, mm. Herald who Love. broke the uh, priest uh, sex abuse right. scandal. And, uh, one of the things that they talked about there was about common knowledge, how, you know, there's always, and, and, and you know, I, I, grew, I grew up Catholic, I, you know, and, and I still go to church every now and then. And, but I remember growing up is that I would, I would always hear the rumors. It's like, it would, it would be a joke, right. About priests, you know, uh, messing around with all the right. boys and stuff like that. It's just sort of like this joke. There would be just sort of, ha ha ha. And nobody really did anything about it. Cause there are no names there are no dates there are no places. Well, then spotlight occurs and all of a sudden there's names, there's dates, there's places. And this common knowledge that everybody had about this thing happening became specific knowledge. And when it became specific knowledge, then all of a sudden there was something to act upon. And people came out of the woodwork to say, this is wrong. This is, you know, and all of a sudden it became a movement, right? Right. And so we very much like in our, in our deepest, you know, parts of our little artist souls hope that that that's our big hope with this right is that you're taking the common knowledge that everybody knows that bankers are you know screwing us and blah 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 blah, and turn that into specific knowledge and saying okay these are the actual issues this is stuff that's actually happening let's do something about it well you know it's it's an interesting time we're living in and that everybody you know, can do a podcast. We don't need the, the antenna on top of the hill and the, and the broadcasting license from the FCC. And you can drive Uber. You don't need a medallion from the city anymore. You know, um, I'll, I'll, I'll weave this into what we're doing. You know, Bill Cosby is in jail right now because Hannibal Burris would speak about him in his stand-up comedy act. He, I don't know how much of that you guys know about, but he would, he started grabbed a stand up comedian, starts yeah. talking about somebody's behavior in a nightclub. And three years later, the guy's sitting in a courthouse in Philadelphia. You know, I mean, I, I maybe the, the people should be doing it for themselves a little bit here. I mean, maybe with social media and everything, I, obviously the feds, you know, whatever. It's, it's, there's countless, first off, when you get sued by the patent trolls, as I have been, you realize, oh, it's a big fat fucking system. You don't have, it's not like the patent trolls and the judges and the attorneys who are defending me. They don't, they all go to the same country club on Sundays. They're not, they're not looking out for you. They're all in, they're in that snow globe and you're outside of it. And you naively think this judge is going to do something for you or the sheriff or mm -hmm. this councilman or, or, you know, where's where, where I'm going to call my my senator you know, they're all in it they're on the same they're on the same side we it's like it's like there's there's cowboys and indians in a movie you would watch when you're a kid and you thought they were fighting but when lunch came around they all just sat at the same table and ate craft service that's exactly what we're dealing with here but we're watching the movie we're going okay my guy's gonna get their guy no no they're all the same guy they're wearing different outfits and maybe it's time for us to do it for ourselves. Guys like you, guys like Hannibal Barris, guys who start, maybe this is, there's countless other examples, I think now, maybe this is the new world order. 
Adam, you nailed it, man. And and I just I, I just have to applaud you for that because it reminded me, of course, of George Carlin, right? And his shtick, it's a big club and you're not in it. If you've ever heard that, and if you haven't, please go online and watch it. Um, yeah, that's what we found, man. I mean, look, over the course of our lifetimes, but particularly after the collapse of 2008, that circle has just gotten smaller and smaller and it's a noose around the neck of the integrity of law and also freedom in terms of, you know, everything that we think we are, right? Supply, demand. Do we think we have demand right now in the COVID age? Right. Who's paying to prop up this com- this country right now? It's the Fed. Right. What, what is the money going to? Is it going to the 30 million people that are, are, are unemployed? Um, are they churning and burning? No, they're going to reduce that. But if you really understand the numbers, and this correlates to what our story is, because it wasn't fixed in 2008, it just got worse today. <laughs> this is an inevitable conclusion of what didn't get fixed before. So we all know, right, that if you let a gangster on the side of a corner get away with it and you take the cops off the beat, the criminals win every time. Well, and to your point, and could, I don't mean to sound so cynical because there has to be a way out of this eventually. But when Adam brought up, you know, I was thinking, oh, Cosby Weinstein, when you were talking and when Adam brought up Cosby, I'm thinking, yeah, but we didn't have to start by making rape illegal. Right. You know, so at this point, we have to start from way behind the starting line. So that's what that's what feels so hopeless. Well, let me let me address that real quick. And Eric, I'll turn it over to you in a second. But we, we're actually in the mix of this right now. So in our series, we just went to all the right people that got this thing right. So trust me, there's tens of thousands of people throughout the country that are heroes that got this right. They were just suborned. And so we're not just talking about average everyday Americans uh, that were victims. We're talking about people in the system that tried to do the right thing every step of the way. There were whistleblowers. And we have whistleblowers that are the most crucial whistleblowers in this entire story, guys that were in the C-suites at Countrywide, the C-suites of Citibank, the C-suites of the Securities and Exchange Commission. And quite frankly, we have the former director of investigations for the FBI, third in command of the FBI, right underneath at that time, Mueller and um, and, uh, Comey. And this guy had this thing dead to rights as early as 2004. They were trying to do a national sweep to end this. And what happened was he got stopped by higher ups that are all still in Congress today, quite frankly. They stopped the funding for it. And we have him on camera. And we also have another gentleman from the uh, Department of Justice who was third, actually, he was in charge of white collar investigations for the Department of Justice. He was right so, under Lanny Brewer. Right under Lanny Brewer during the um, Obama administration with Eric Holder. And so, you know, all of these administrations were in it. It's, it's complex to a degree, but really in the end, it's not rocket science. You just have to see it. I mean, it's, it's just, it's, it's the chronology of it and to understand what it led to. And really in the end, when, it, when you have a powerful system that's able to circle the wagons around it, because as you just mentioned, Gina, I think the perfect analogy is Epstein and Weinstein. All of those scenarios took place over the course of decades, right? So we know that the prosecutors had information on Weinstein. We know that, you know, guys in Florida had stuff on Epstein. Why didn't they prosecute him? Well, because there was powerful people preventing them from prosecuting him. This is a variation of that as well. But we're not talking, we're talking about something that literally devastated tens of millions of people and cost trillions of dollars to try to clean up, only to take us right back to the same story. Uh, We need to... uh prepare for a break here, but I want to give you guys a plug before we bid you adieu. The five-part docuseries, The Con, and uh, it comes out on virtual cinemas August 7th, and then it's available for digital rental on the 21st of August, and you can go to the website, thecon.tv. And uh, yeah, I think it's, it's time, you know, that people educate themselves and we see the physical version of people sort of taking to the streets, but we now need to do a sort of digital version of taking to the streets where people educate themselves, like going out and marching and tearing down statues and shit. It's all well and good. But if you go home and turn on the TV and you're just as dumb as you were uh, the day before, or just as, just as uh, yeah, you need some, you need to be fluent in a language, which is a financial language that no one is fluent in. Everyone needs to speak finances as a second language and nobody learns it. Everyone learns Spanish or French or German. They don't learn this second language. And we're in a new world order where you can do all your banking from your phone 
And if you don't start learning this as a second language, it should just be taught. My daughter's going into the ninth grade. She's taking Spanish as an elective, which is great, but take finances. It should all be taught as a second language. We should all be fluent in it for our travels around this uh, great planet of ours. And otherwise, put a quick- you'll be victimized by it. Yes. Yeah. Can I just put a quick positive spin on all of this, given mm-hmm. all that's going on? Everything is so divided and, and divisive. And it's it's we've never been farther apart in any way. And I'm going to po- posit this to Eric and Patrick. I'm going to guess that when it comes to all this criminal behavior and Congress and the feds, I'm going to guess that that is something that the Republicans and Democrats are working on together. Oh. That's something that they're both equally criminal the only in terms of this. The only bipartisan agreement you ever get is on corruption. And I think right. equal to that, <laughs> is that the only bipartisan agreement you can have in a polarized uh, America at the moment is people knowing who's screwing them. Yeah. And, and, and it's and it's both. Oh, yeah. It's 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 baked into the bread. Uh, Eric, Patrick, uh, thank you guys for uh, joining us today. And uh, Godspeed. We'll be we'll be watching. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Be well. Uh, all right. Let me hit uh, Mercari here. Speaking of uh, making a little money, it's uh, fast. It's an easy way to declutter your home and get paid a little bit. And this stuff doesn't end up in a landfill, which I – that's my whole thing. I just can't th- – I hate this throwaway world we've created, and Mercari's going to help solve that. In minutes, you can download Mercari, take pics of your stuff – Add a description, and then it's listed just like that. Once it's sold, Mercari emails a shipping label, and you stick it on the box, and you ship it from your home. No meetups, no hassles, over 50 million downloads in all 50 states. You can try Mercari, make that extra cash that we were talking about. Be smart. This will be the first step in you being literate financially sell and buy almost anything from home and uh you can find it at the app store or you can go to mercari.com that's m-e-r-c-a-r-i mercari america's no meetup marketplace all right we'll take a quick break we'll come back with gina and bald in the news right after this give me the news with grad news with gina grad break Viral, all those crazy Trump tweets. Give me news with Gina Grad. Trouble in the Middle East. Celebrity drunk meltdowns. Need news with Gina Gina. The news with Gina Grad. So Herman Cain, he was a one-time Republican presidential candidate and former CEO of Godfather's Pizza, which we had in the Midwest. I don't know how many other people are familiar with it. He has died from coronavirus, according to an obituary sent from his verified Twitter account. He was 74 and was hospitalized earlier this month. And his Twitter account said this week he was being treated with oxygen in his lungs. As a co-chair of Black Voices for Trump, Kane was one of the surrogates at President Trump's uh, rally in Tulsa June 20th, which saw at least eight Trump advance uh, team staffers in attendance. They did test positive for coronavirus, though no one can confirm where Kane got it. Uh, though Kane was vocal about not having to wear masks at the Tulsa rally and at the Mount Rushmore Uh, 4th of July festivities. Uh, In commentary videos for his website that aired in June, Kane called on Americans to wear face masks, saying that the guidance now shows its effectiveness. He was, uh, there was a lot of talk about him not wearing a mask, but the mask, the mask was always sold to me as preventing other people from getting you, not you not getting it. Right. So well, I guess it's around other people are not wearing. It's really other people that's not wearing masks. Not So right. the argument I, I should be the, he the, hung around with people who didn't wear masks. Yeah. And the distinction people say, I guess, you know, now that we're breaking it down more finely these days, there's a mask and face covering. Face covering is a bandana. You know, it's a courtesy. A, a mask is an N95 that that'll keep you pretty safe. So, you know, it's it, who knows? Yeah. Well, I'm getting ready to go to Texas. Um, by the way, <laughs> everyone is everyone's freaked out about Texas. But as I was telling my family when I was explaining them, I'm going to Texas. Um, California's doing worse than Texas by by the numbers I've seen. I mean, in terms of we're hotter than Texas right now, as it as it pertains to this, the news is all about Texas, but California statistically or from a pure number standpoint, you might be better off 
going to Texas. Yeah, but there's, I don't there's, know. Numbers of ways, there's a number of ways to slice that. The most recent numbers I saw was that over the last seven days, Texas and California had almost the same amount of cases, like 68,000 to 69,000. But California's population is 25% bigger than Texas's. So you can, I mean, there's a number of ways to parse these numbers, but that's that would indicate that uh, Texas is doing worse per capita. A little, know, whatever, but whatever it's, it's marginal because I think there are little lower new cases, but they're also I'm telling higher. you numbers. This could have been a couple of days ago, but there, there was sixty-eight thousand. Uh, I just 000. I looked this morning. It was a little. It, it's 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 kind of a lateral move, is what I'm saying. Or you can Max Pat can look see what's up there. It's semi-lateral. The point is, is all the talk is about Texas. California doesn't get the hype on the news, so everyone thinks going to Texas is bad, but if you live in California, it's essentially a, a lateral move. Now, how you get there on a Southwest jet, at least formally, uh, that may mm -hmm. that may be a different issue. You don't have to worry about that. No, well, speaking private. of that, this mm. no longer applies to you, at least this trip, but this might be helpful, a helpful tip for, for us and for the listeners. Um, you know, Teresa and I have a podcast, Easy Listening, and she found this show called Rich Roll, which I hadn't heard of. And it's an episode where they have a doctor named Dr. Grieger who talks about coronavirus. One of the things he talks about is like, well, what about the horrible air in the plane? And you want to make sure those vents are off. And the doctor says, no, 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 no. You want that vent on you. You want to take your neighbor's vents. You want to point them at you. And he said, uh, essentially that, you know, they do have HEPA filters, which is very helpful. And the more air that's coming at you, it's coming off of you so the air around you isn't staying stagnant so if you can point those vents at yourself you're blowing everything away from you and it's helpful if you have to travel i actually have a clip uh right here from uh, ritual yeah that's funny so it's got that's Rick the thing i thought of <laughs> um we have and it's 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 it, this is i think it's a lateral move we california so says max pata as of two minutes ago has almost 500 uh confirm 500,000 confirmed cases 491 and uh about 9,000 deaths and Texas has 42 so sorry has 400,000 sorry 423,000 I I I have this thing it I I'm, I'm I don't know if you guys are with me if anything can come from this thing but when we're doing statistics and people are like since March 23rd, there have been 4,826 new confirmed cases, and then there's 291. I want to get into a roundup era. I want everyone to go 300, yeah. 4,000. I or, might, yes, because they start with March 27th. Percentages. Yeah, they go since the just say since the end of March, there was 200 the deaths and 5,000 new cases. All, all there's a margin for error. It's baked in. I understand it, but I'm swimming in in numbers anyway. Yep. California has like uh, three quarters. Sorry, Texas has like three quarters the populace that uh, California has. And uh, they have 9,000 deaths and Texas has 7,000 deaths. I'm, I'm rounding up. And uh, they have 500,000 cases and we have 400 and change. And the, the point is, is it is pretty adjusted for population it's pretty lateral what we what we're going through and what they're going through and who the fuck knows anything about this thing i mean went all the way through new york went all the way through new jersey now there's no problemos over there now the heat was going to kill it remember the heat was going to kill it oh yeah, yeah that was going to save us all it was going to die off as soon as it got above 85 outside and now you go to the hottest places uh, you know it's july in texas and socal i mean it doesn't get any hotter than this and now it's yeah. now there's a spike i mean we were locked down. It was going to go away. Now it's back. I, it, I mean, well, I and everyone's anyone... like second wave, second wave. This is the first wave, baby. I don't know if anyone knows anything anymore, but Be all right. Before we move off of Herman King, can I make an observation? Just see if you guys agree with me or if I'm the only one who feels this way. Um, we, uh, his account, his verified account, I think Gina alluded to it. Um, three days ago, uh, uh, they have the tweet. I, I actually saw it in my timeline and was. I remember thinking like, you know, like they're, they're, they're treating with oxygen and stuff. I'm like, oh, that sounds pretty bad. He's been for three months and then at the end it says uh he really is getting better he's coming home soon he, he's he's very excited to come home i was like oh, i don't know if that's true but whatever that you know I, I assumed it was you know positive thinking that's fine and then over the that was three days ago over the next three days up till today 
th- th- his account, and I, you know, there's an Iron Sheik thing going on here where it's clearly not him. He's probably comatose or dying uh, at this time. In this three days, the th- it's, his thing is full of, uh, go past this, just, just scroll. Dozens of hyper-partisan, like, you know, tweets about how uh, these people are evil and these people are awful and getting people, just, just you know, touchstones for, for political, you know, uh, discourse. And I, I just feel like that's so distasteful and so gross. Like, this guy is literally dying or dead as you're posting these. There's something like from last night and this morning. That's so ghoulish and gross. Like, who the fuck is doing that? I, I assume they're doing it that as knowledge. The guy's literally dying over the course of these three days. And I just left him with such a bad taste in my mouth. I don't know if I'm on a soapbox or anything, but it's, it's worse than, I don't know, it's so disrespectful. I agree. Like, I'm picturing myself clinging to life and Lynette's talking about um, left turn arrows <laughs> and you, you know, your, your Twitter Potholes. feed is still full of all your the, the greatest fucking hits. backup beeper in the in the garbage yeah. truck at six thirty in the morning. She's like hitting all the usual spots, and I'm wondering, people who don't signal, click it or tick it. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think it's in it's in poor taste. It's weird. It's <laughs> it's weird. It. it it's weird, and like, it, who's thinking we gotta we gotta get these out while you know while the guys fucking literally flylining? I don't I don't I don't know anything it's anymore. I, I really don't. I agree, it's gross. Sorry. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna just stay on uh, COVID for one more thing, and then we're actually gonna go back to Texas. So British scientists have determined, and I don't know if Dr. Drew's talked about any of this, that there are six different types of COVID nineteen distinguished by specific clusters of symptoms. Can now, I say I've this? Not, Sorry yeah. about COVID. Um, don't be, don't be this person and don't be this nation. We all know this person where someone goes, Hey, this weekend we're going to raging waters. And everyone kind of goes, yeah, we'll see it. I'll see it. I'll believe it when I see it. You know, the people who just go like, yeah, we're never going to do that. That just means this person fucks up all the time or is late or doesn't do anything. Don't be that nation. Like Russia's like, hey, we got a cure coming out in two weeks. We've got a vaccine uh-huh. for COVID. We're like, well, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, we'll, we'll, wait till I, okay. I'll believe it when I inject it. <laughs> Why don't you sober up and come back and then we can talk? It's like, yeah. you know, so Russia's that way. Mexico's a little bit that way. China's definitely that way. Sure. Like, here's North what's Korea, going on. Yeah. I'm sure. So if you're like fucking Finland or something, like if you hear Finland just said, Two weeks, we got a cure for COVID nineteen. We'd all be fucking chilling the champagne, Tell right? Tell me more. I heard that story four Absolutely. days ago out of Russia, which means we got ten more days before the cure comes in, and everyone's like, ah, "Okay, well, I'm not going to take the mask off just yet." Yeah. Like, don't be one oh. of those nations. We all it's 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 easy to figure out. All you have to do is say this, and then you go this nation, and if it's the Chinas or the Russias or the North Koreas of the world or the whomevers of the world, you go, okay. Well, isn't that sweet? Now, can we have a competent nation verify this? Because we're not really listening to you. So, but if you think, if it came out of Canada, you'd be like, oh. Oh, we're listening. Oh, okay. Go on. It's it's the same news. It's we're going to have a a vaccination in two weeks. And if it comes out of Canada, we're like, this is the greatest fucking news ever. And if it comes out of Russia, we're like, we'll see. And that story broke, I don't know, three days ago or something. When the vaccine becomes available, and again, we have the entire world working around the clock, which is why they say it usually takes 10, 11 years, and now we're looking at a year and a half. Will who will you take the first round? Uh, probably, I guess so. I guess I'll just ask Dr. Drew about it, but I'm sure I'm sure I will. I'm not a I don't take the flu shot every year, which I should do. But uh, well, that's I the don't. other thing. They said this this may be one of those yearly you need your yearly COVID shot a booster shot. Right. Yeah. Because, yeah. you know, like a flu, it's the strain changes every year. What if China does come out with a vaccine? Will you take the first round? <laughs> you know, I, I, I never even think about this stuff. I'm just like, I'm sure it'll all be vetted before it gets to my main vein. So yeah, the FDA has to approve it to be. I know, but what about country. but what about thalidomide? You know, like what about the stuff that seemed fine? <laughs> Deep holes, you know. Yeah, thalidomide, baby. Been listening. Someone's been listening. We didn't start the fire. Yeah. Oh God! I, oh right, I love that song. But that's the thing. It's like that was supposed to just be a con, you know, wasn't that like a convenient drug for morning sickness? Well, who knew? Yeah, so, I I don't know. I mean, that was back when athletes would smoke and do commercials right. for Chesterfields and stuff like that. I I don't know. I'm I'm not. I'm not 
you know, like again, like my relationship with the government and their decisions is a little dubious right now. But in this department, I'm always just line them up, give them the shots. Okay, um, I like it. Max Apata, uh, I am. Uh, I'm getting ready to make my pilgrimage to Laguna Seca coming up in in uh, next week, and I and I realize I've kind of talked about it a little bit, but I don't know who knows what what car I'm taking. I'm taking a car that's different than the car I normally take a little kind of pea shooter kind of a car. And, uh, in the vein of uh, inspired by my trip to Chicago where all the guys were on quads, uh, buzzing up and down the street doing wheelies. <laughs> I took the thing out to just shake it out a little. Just, you, you know, when you build a race car and you haven't driven it, you want to see how it tracks. Like you want to kind of let go of the steering wheel and see if it pulls to the right or pulls to the left or, or whatever, and I just uh, for thirty seconds just kind of buzz the buzz the shop, and we'll uh, we'll play a play a little shot. You can go to amcrawl.com and watch it, but you can just hear it here. Setting off all the alarms. Oh, there's a there's a good one, uh, Max. Pat, you can stop it. There's a good one of uh, me going by the thing. I think it's the oh, first I'll have to, one. I'll have to load that one up. All I, right, you figure it out. You're taking you're you're taking the one that looks like when kids learn how to draw cars. Yes. Like side up, <laughs> side down, side down. It's a mini little pea shooting box, but the same thrills of driving this little hollowed out little. The rims are 13 inches. Now I don't know. Uh, Gina, your Subaru has 16 inch rims on it or 18 inch rims. It's like a 13 inch rim. It's it's a little <laughs> four cylinder Japanese box. But when people want to know, like everyone goes, how fast are you going? How fast are you going? Well, I don't know, but there's 21 other boxes that'll be right next to me going as fast as they can. And that's where the excitement comes. The The sound and this raw kind of rough feeling of having no windows in the side and no everyone's on the same tires and doing the same thing. So it's this little, it's a it's a fast, fun little shitbox kind of grouping. And there'll be like 25 guys out there and they'll all just be going for it at the same time. And it's nice. every bit as exciting as the big horsepower, crazy multi-million dollar class that I may normally uh, run in. It's called the uh, Different Drummer 510. And then you get the whole <laughs> story about this came, it was on a East, the, you know, started on the East Coast and the guy uh, bought it at whatever dealership and he stripped it and built it for a race car. These, these cars all have the story. This is the story starts in 1971 and all these names of all these guys, half of them are dead now, how it competed on the East Coast for all those years and blah, blah, blah. And then you bring them here, you resurrect them, and then you, you tell the story. All right. Sorry, Gina. Go. Oh, we got, a, we got, the, we got the buzz by. Oh, let's see. This is a little better. I don't know why that car. I don't know why that I probably set it off. You're a menace. I'm a menace to society. All right. Were you, did you happen to do that at around 3 a.m. in uh, <laughs> Valley Village last night? Because that something woke me up. That noise, that monstrous noise, just oh. like your car, scared the shit out of me. I finally went back to sleep. And then our house almost got knocked over. From I, We were very close to the earthquake. I've, I've never, I have never been prouder of myself than when I had the earthquake. We had an earthquake last night at 4.30 in the morning mm -hmm. or thereabout. Yeah, 4.30. I got up this morning and I've been, I've been pissed at this for a long time. I've been here since the 72 earthquake. The 72 earthquake was like 5.45, maybe 6 a.m. But you're still, you're, you're, you're complete. An oh. earthquake when you're up and you're on your feet and have a cup of coffee in you and are wearing something is a completely different experience than dreaming about God knows what and being waken from your sleep. You don't, when I was a kid during the 72 earthquake, I was just a little kid. Um, I started dreaming about like war and Nazis. And I thought someone had blown up. 
I remember specifically I had like it was blow, a blitzkrieg. blown us up, right? Yeah. That was my dream. And then because it didn't make sense, because if it, if we blew up, we wouldn't just be shaking. I immediately pictured right. a giant bomb with a fuse that was lit and the fuse was like, we're shaking and then we're going to blow, you know? And that's my, my brain was like trying to make sense of it when I was eight years old. And I woke up and I, it, it was dark. Everyone was completely disoriented because everyone was asleep. Then the next right. one that hit was in 94, middle of the fucking night, middle of the morning. Everyone was passed out and everyone was fucked up, you know, dishes falling from the cabinets yep. in the kitchen and everything totally disoriented and i've said why can't we have an earthquake at noon or 1 p.m on a saturday yeah, you know what I mean? and i fuck, i fucking went and looked that shit up last night was 4 30 dead nuts on i mean 4 30 yep. in the a.m is you're 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 never more out of it especially if you go to bed about 12 30 one o'clock like i do every night 4 30 i'm as yep. far out of it as you can possibly get uh last night 4:29 in the morning. The the big one we had uh, 20 years uh, 25 years before, 4:30. <gasps> Brutal. I I Shit. I looked it up. It said 4:30 in like 55 seconds from X Bad. The, the point is is we're less than a minute apart. Like the two biggest ones we've had here in the last 25 years have both taken place at 4:30 a.m. One took place at 4:29 a.m. in fi- 52 seconds. The other one took place at 4:30 like what the fuck? Don't tell me that's not there's not something going on. There's all the hours. No, I'm blowing the lid off this shit, man. I'm going full con. I mean, well, of all the times these things could hit, what the fuck's with 430? What's yeah. even the fuck with the window between like 3 a.m. and 6 a.m.? Why is that the window for an earthquake? Sorry. Yeah. Remember the Bay earthquake that hit right before the World Series in 89? Aha! Uh-huh. 5.50, right before first pitch. That's a polite earthquake, 5.15 p.m. Yes, well, that's a courteous was, earthquake. Uh, we, given all three of us, I think I was probably closest to it. It was like a 4.6. So each shook our house. It, it. I mean, it was terrifying. We run in. I go, let's check on We got to check on the kid. We run into his room. He's just sitting up because we're terrified. And I was like, oh, he's going to start screaming or crying. And I go, are you okay? Did you feel it? And he goes, it was just an earthquake. Earthquake. So that, that is a California boy. He's not afraid. It's an earthquake and it's no big deal. Well, ever since I've tore apart so many houses and done earthquake rehab for a job and gotten into the bones of so many houses, I've just, if you live in a dwelling that is framed with wood and has stucco or siding on the outside or anything that's even close to modern or anything that's not masonry. It's only unreinforced masonry. Mm-hmm. That is all. That is your enemy. If you're not unreinforced unin- masonry, then you're 100% fine. It's apartment building from the 60s, house from the 50s, it doesn't matter. The only thing that ever falls over is the chimney. In, a, in an old mm-hmm. house, the chimney always falls over. But other than that, unreinforced masonry is it. Anything else, you're completely and utterly fine. There's nothing, and and that's why there's never any damage here. When they go to these countries where they have to build everything out of cinder block and brick and stuff like that, they're destroyed because masonry is what is what goes. It's all flexibility. That's all engineering is, like a suspension bridge. Well, and that's the fun. That's the irony, I would imagine, because our house, which is all wood, and uh, you know, like when we're at work. And, you know, these tall buildings at KFI and you really feel it shake. I, I guess the more you feel it shake, the safer you are because it's moving with the earth. It's all. You know what I mean? Yes. It's all you want to be taffy and not matzah. Sorry, Gina. I know that sounds like a hate crime. <laughs> it's been said uh, many times. I know. All right. You want to be leavened. That's right. You want to be leavened. It's obviously, we all do. All right. Let me hit uh, Madison Reed Mister here. Oh, man, this stuff is good. Now, they've been making hair coloring for women for a long time, and they do a pretty kick ass job on that. And they spread it out to the fellas. And it's nice, man, especially if you're like me and you got some of that gray kicking up around the temples and and beyond. Uh, You don't have the shoe polish look. You have the natural look. And uh, I just wanted a little more pepper mixed in with my salt and uh i used it and it worked nicely um the whole packet comes comes in a little box comes got the gloves put the gloves on 
you just take the color gel, comes in a little like mylar packet, and you put a little color gel in your gloves, and you kind of wipe your hands back and forth, and you just run it, run your hands through your hair. Just run them through your hair. Then uh, you do the activator, same thing, just a little cream, you run it through your hair. Sit, sit there, 10 minutes, rinse it off, and uh, and it's natural looking. You get the, the gray goes away, but it's not that uh, Sharpie kind of John Travolta-y <laughs> look. It's just a natural way to do it. And they got you covered over there at Madison Reed Mister. Right, Dawson? Go to MadisonReedMister.com. That's M-A-D-I-S-O-N-R-E-E-D-M-R.com. And use code Adam for 10% off plus free shipping on your first box. Again, that's code Adam. Let's do one more. Gina Grad, or sorry, cut you off on oh, your right. other COVID case. No, that's... Here. That's okay. Let's let's move on to this one in case you haven't heard. Is there one more seat available on that private jet? Because Joe Rogan might want to go with you. Mm. He says he's moving to Texas in search of more freedom, according to MySanAntonio.com. His podcast, he said this on the Joe Rogan Experience. He announced the news of his relocation from L.A. to Texas on Friday. And Rogan cited overpopulation, traffic, economic despair, and his need for more freedom among the reasons for his decision. He's 52. He also does the UFC commentating. Uh, He reportedly stands to save millions of dollars in taxes. And just to give you a little example of that, Rogan signed a deal in May with Spotify for more than $100 million to air his podcast exclusively on the streaming service beginning September. That's according to the Wall Street Journal. The Houston Chronicle.com says, um, while the deal would be would be subject to a 13.3% income tax rate in California. Texas forgoes individual income taxes, resulting in $13 million in tax breaks. Yeah. Uh, everybody I know that's got a couple of nickels to rub together is kind of looking toward an exit strategy. Um, I was talking to Mike August about this earlier today, uh, not about Joe or Texas per se, but kind of saying, are we just going to keep going down this road? And then what happens when you move to Texas? But then he says, Texas and some of these countries are going to secede. Like they're going to try to break it up at, at, at at a certain point. It'll be an interesting next, uh, it'll be interesting lifetime for my kids, but, um, people really California and, and LA has seen it before with productions that left town, uh, the runaway production. We, we, we just, it, the exact same model applies. They just got a little grabby with the taxes and a little overregulated and they made it a little too difficult. And the people who love this country and who love ostensibly keep talking about paying more in taxes and are always very charitable on that side of the aisle, they all picked up and left. They came yeah. back to where their houses were, but they dropped off all the money and the Carolinas and Toronto, and Toronto everywhere. And, and so they fled. So if that group, if Hollywood will get on an airplane and leave to do business, then eventually the Joe Rogans and the Mark Garrigas's and folks like that are just going to get up and leave. They're just, they're just going to leave. And, and we, we've proven it once and not too long ago. So I don't know why they don't have those kinds of discussions. Like there used to be California used to be a little bit of a monopoly. We just like, Hey, where are you going to go? Like, you're not going anywhere. Mm-hmm. You, you can't, it's not even, not even practical. Well, you know, Mark Garagos has a private jet at his disposal and maybe the internet, maybe air conditioning, 80 inch plasma TVs, you porn and the internet in general, just and, and zooming. Maybe, maybe it doesn't matter where you live. Yeah, the, anymore. COVID lo- the, the COVID lockdowns are going to proving that you can work from anywhere for and a lot of jobs. And you can go. So when I was growing up, if you were a Hollywood guy, you can't live outside of LA. There's no good steakhouses or there's no good nightlife or there's no, or maybe, maybe you like Chick-fil-A or, you know, there's a, there's a, uh, uh, there's, there's a big brand that you like, you know, it was sort of like you couldn't buy Levi's at a Sears. You had to buy tough skins. Well, now you just buy Levi's online and you can go eat wherever you want. And, all these places that seem kind of podunky, they're not so podunky anymore. Nashville's a big, beautiful town, lots of good restaurants, lots of good entertainment. And the, and the list goes on and on. These, these places. Oh, yeah. 
Milwaukee, Kansas City. I mean, right. uh, tons of these places are great. Right. So now that all the other locales have become a little more attractive through taxes or regulation or the lack thereof and or the culture um, in L.A. and Los, Ange- uh, Los Angeles, California, are sort of on the decline. They're going to see a lot of this. And when they see a lot of it, they're going to see a tax base go like right now. 13% seems pretty darn good, not to the guy who's cutting the check, but it seems pretty good to California. But uh, you're going to get zero. I know 5% sounds low to you when you're at 13%, but you know it's less than 5%. Zero. I sound like Nancy Grace. Now, Nancy, what would that sound like? I know that 5% sounds low to you, but guess what? I'm not a mathematician, and I'm willing to bet that you're not either. But guess what's lower than 5%? Hmm. I'll give you one guess. Hmm. Zero. Zero. That's what's lower than 5%. Yeah. Sometimes I see, I say things and I realize I, I sound like the people I make fun of when I'm saying it in the middle of saying it, but um, they're, they're going to get there. New York's having a problem with their heavy hitters leaving their big tax base, people getting out and going to Florida and stuff. And I think so maybe a year or so ago, but uh, Cuomo was basically just laying it out. He was like, hey, man, we need this tax money. You guys are leaving. And it's like, yeah, that's that's kind of what people do now. Mm-hmm. And the notion of travel is so much more comfortable. Uh, people, there was no Airbnb. There was no Southwest. There was no yeah. people. No one had a second house in Palm Springs or in Nevada or wherever. Like, no one had any of that. And now it seems also plausible now, right? Doable. Like, it yeah. seems very mm-hmm. doable now. And California is going to have to kind of wake up to the notion that they're kind of living 25 years ago. This is now. People work from home, travel all the time, do whatever. And there's going to be more of this. And unfortunately, it will be your tax base. It's going to be the it's going to be the people that are paying the most that are that are leaving the the people you're getting the most from. You're going to get zero from and the people who are rely on the state. They're not going anywhere. So there's going to create there's going to be a math that's might not might not work out for the state. All right, Gina, let's bring it home. You got it. I'm Gina Grad, and that's the news. Gina, Gina Grad. That was the news with Gina Grad. Simply Safe 60 here. Yeah, Simply Safe. Most home security companies trap you with high prices, tricky contracts, lousy customer support. There's uh, one security company that's a no brainer. That's Simply Safe. Two eyes in there. Everything to protect your home, an arsenal of uh, sensors and cameras for every room, window and door tailored specifically to your home. So you go online, you set it up, you figure out how many windows and doors and motion detectors you want, and then peel and stick up and running in under half an hour in most cases. You plug in the home, the main brain, and everything else runs off batteries. No drilling, no pulling wires. Batteries last up to 10 years. Professional monitoring day and night, ready to send police, fire, medical professionals if there's an issue. Get going with no long-term contracts and uh, get it up and running. Lickety split. And no sales, guys. No fine print. Starts at just 15 bucks a month. Simply Safe, right, Dawson? Head to simplysafe.com slash Adam and get a free HD camera for our listeners. That's simplysafe.com slash Adam to make sure they know our show sent you. All right. I'm going to be in uh, San Antonio. I don't know if I brought that up tonight, mm-hmm. and, uh, tomorrow night, live podcast. We'll do those uh, Friday. Today, we'll have uh, Ben Shapiro on and then Greg Gutfeld will be on a Saturday and we'll do the live stuff. Then we'll do stand up. I'll do stand up after that. So uh, you can you can enjoy that. Uh, mm-hmm. that'll, these shows will, uh, those shows will air on Monday and Tuesday, by the way. So they'll have some fresh material at the top of the week over there. You can go to, uh, adamcroll.com for all the live shows and you can, uh, get, I'm your emotional support animal. I think, yeah, there it is. Not dog jumped in my <laughs> head. I don't know the name of my own book, but, uh, it's, give it a rating at Amazon. I read them and I enjoy them. I want to thank Eric Vaughn. And Patrick Lovell for coming in here. The uh, five-part docuseries, The Con. You can catch that at The Con. 
or catch up on it at uh, thecon.tv. And, of course, uh, Def Rat Guy as well. Check out Mr. Macho Man, the single on uh, YouTube, sung by his friend, close friend, Josh Gardner. All right. So, until next time, this is Adam for Eric and Patrick and uh, Def and Gina and Bald saying mahalo. <laughs> <laughs>